Hello, friends. I'm your co-host, James Rafferty, with Ty Gibson, and this is Books of the Book. We are in Hebrews chapter 12, and we want to invite you to open your Bible and a listening ear and join us. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, like many of the chapters in Hebrews, James, begins with the word, therefore. So we need some context. What we're about to launch into in chapter 12 is referring back for its context to chapter 11. Mm -hmm. We have a whole list of individuals who have been mentioned, whose faith accomplished great exploits, and now, having concluded that list, we come to chapter 12 and Paul says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, yep. let us lay aside <laughs> every way and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. Now, I really like this because this is pointing out, Ty, that there is a besetting sin. All of us have sins. All of us have weaknesses. All of us have problems that we're dealing with in our walk, in our Christian experience. But there is a besetting sin, I believe, of human nature. Now, this besetting sin began right at the very inception, right at the very fall, right at the very beginning. And that besetting sin, I believe, is the inclination that we have to find fault, to look at our failures, our imperfections, either in others or in ourselves. Mm. You know, when Adam was confronted by God with, with partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he pointed to Eve, and Eve pointed to the serpent, and we've been pointing ever since. Mm. Now, Paul is saying here, you're surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses. You know, the only way that we can overcome this besetting sin of finding fault is by recognizing God's perspective on mm. our lives. All of the witnesses of Hebrews 11 have one thing in common. The record of their lives is minus any failure, any sin, mm, any mm. record of where they came short of God's glory. Have you noticed that? Yeah, well, the, the chapter just gives a glowing report yes. about each one of them, and there's no yes. mention of any of their failures, which we have in the biblical record. I mean, we know that these were human beings who are weak and faltering. Noah built an ark but he also got drunk. Abraham and Sarah were faithful, but they also, he lied about his wife. She laughed about the idea of mm -hmm. having a child. Moses, he fled Egypt, but he also killed an Egyptian. Yes. Smote the rocket in patience. Look at all the, they're not mentioned there. We're surrounded with witnesses who from God's perspective are seen as perfect and complete in Jesus Christ by faith. We also need to have this perspective. Mm. See people as they are in Jesus, lay aside the, the inclination we have to judge, criticize, and condemn others. Because One of the Great, yeah, one of the great truths of the gospel is that love covers a multitude of yes. sins. That doesn't mean that love becomes deceived. I mean, God knows yes. our failures. He mm -hmm. sees those things in us that are out of harmony with His will and that are contrary to His love. But God looks upon us and exercises confidence. He instills faith in us by exercising faith. Yes, you know, it's interesting because Paul in verse 39 of 11 is calling us to the better thing, the better experience, something better. The essence then of what Paul is saying is keep positive, keep to the affirmative. Jesus does not dwell upon our sins, upon our failures, mm. so why should we? Yes, amen, amen. I want to connect verses 1 and 2 now, James, because we have this cloud of witnesses, the mm -hmm. faithful of all ages that are mm -hmm. delineated in chapter 11, and then in the light of their faith, we're encouraged to lay aside sin, to run the race that is set before us with endurance. But at the end of verse 1, there's a comma. It's not the end of his thought. He, he, he's not saying, hey, you need to overcome sin. You need to run this race. He's not imposing responsibility in a vacuum here. He's saying to us, run this race, lay aside your sin, comma, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In other words, the means by which, the way in which mm -hmm. we lay aside mm -hmm. sin and run this race with endurance is by looking to Jesus. I really like this verse and I really like this context. Basically what we're saying here is not only do we need to keep positive, not only do we need to keep our positive focus, but we also need to keep our focus on Jesus, not on man. Mm -hmm. You see, with Christ, we will 
not grow weary. We will not faint. When we focus on men, when we focus on ourselves, we're going to grow weary. We're going to feel overwhelmed. But when we keep our focus on Christ, who is the author and the mm -hmm. finisher of our faith, we're going to find that he's going to finish the work he's begun in us. This is, this is amazing that it says he has authored our faith. Now, we know an author is someone who writes a book, someone who originates, originates. something. So, so Jesus is the originator of our faith. Yes. He's the one who has produced it. He's the one who's worked it out in his own human experience mm -hmm. as our representative. And having authored that faith, then the Apostle Paul says he finished it. He originated it and he finished our faith. Now that's vital because many times we think Jesus started it, but he's asking us to finish mm. it. He begun it, but we've got to do the rest. No, Hebrews is telling us very clearly he begun it and he will finish it. That's and right. that's very encouraging. That's right. So he's authored our faith, he's originated, and he has finished our faith. So at that point, someone may be thinking, I've wondered at times, well, if he authored it, if he finished it, is there anything at all involved in my own experience? Well, there is. Mm -hmm. The faith that he's authored and finished is a living, vibrant faith that is clearly referring back to the experience of all these faithful whom we noticed in our previous time together, who when they had faith, when they experienced faith, they accomplished great things mm -hmm. by that faith. Faith is active, it's mm -hmm. aggressive, it moves, it accomplishes things. Faith without works is dead. Being alone. And the very context of Hebrews 12 is telling us, lay aside every weight, that sin that does so easily beset mm -hmm. you. Look to Jesus. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary, faint in your mind. Verse 4, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So there is this active faith, this faith that is motivated by love, that strives against sin, that resists mm. unto blood. Mm. Now, in this context, we might want to point back to the experience of Jesus in Gethsemane because, frankly, there's nowhere in the Bible that I find where anyone ever resisted unto blood, striving against sin, mm. but Christ. And I think that, that Paul here is speaking metaphorically in a very real sense of an experience that he wants us to have. Mm -hmm. When you look at Matthew chapter 26, you look at the experience that Christ had as he entered into the Gethsemane, you see an outline of the way in which we can strive, we can resist sin. There are basically about eight points here that you can consider, and I just want to go through them really quickly. They're powerful because what you have here is you have Jesus Christ seeking to maintain his connection with the Father. What does he do? First of all, he sings a hymn. We're admonished in the New Testament to sing hymns and spiritual songs. Then as he goes out with his disciples, he, he, he preaches the word. He shares with them prophecies about mm -hmm. what's going to happen to himself. He places his faith in the word. And then he asks his disciples to pray for him. And then he himself seeks help from the Father. He goes off and he prays as he's asked his disciples to pray for him. And then finally he confesses his unwillingness to go in the direction God wants him to go. He says, not my will though, but thine be done. In, in, in this agony of separation, he submits his will to the Father. He says, you know, my will wants to go in this direction, but I submit my will to you, Father. And he prays that three times. Mm, I mm. believe that, that Jesus is outlining for us, as, as Paul points to resisting under blood, Jesus is outlining for us what he would call us to do, to have hope, to sing, to trust in the Word of God, to pray, to have others pray for us, and finally, to submit our will and our way to God's will and God's way, to commit ourselves to him. So when we look to Jesus, Jesus, as Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 admonish us to do, we see incredible things. For example, mm -hmm. Paul says here in verse 2 that when we look to Jesus, one of the things we're going to see, James, is that he authored our faith, he finished our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Amen. The joy that was set before him. And I think, wow, what is it that Jesus is looking forward to as the joy that will be the, the result of this sacrifice. And I'm reminded of his prayer in John 17, where he expressed what his desire was and what he was looking forward to himself after his sacrifice. In chapter 17 of the Gospel of John and verse 24, he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, 
for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus basically says here, I'm going to endure the cross. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move straight through with this infinite self-sacrifice and endure mm -hmm. this pain and suffering because I am looking forward yes. to eternity future, yes. living in fellowship with my sons and daughters, with those who have been redeemed by virtue of the sacrifice. He's looking forward with joy to spending eternity with us. Amen. And you know, it's interesting because as you move through this, tie, you have in verse 5 and onward, you have this exhortation to not forget that God educates us through trial. Now, there are times when it becomes difficult for us to accept and to understand that, that when we're tested, when we're tried, when we're, as the old King James says, when we're chastened by the Lord, that we, we tend to, to chide under it and to think, oh, you know, uh, have I done something wrong? Does God not like me? Is He displeased with me? Mm. No, He loves us. He loves us. I, I discipline my son. I educate my son because I love him. I, I discipline my daughter. I educate my daughter because I love her. God loves us, mm -hmm. and we don't want to forget that. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that, that what God is doing is He is working through these trials to bring good out of them for us. He's not seeking to, to chide us in a negative, but in a positive way. Well, well, Jesus told a parable, the parable of the, the vine and the branches, in which He indicated that when a branch brings forth fruit, God prunes it so yes. it will bring forth more fruit. So, so go. God actually sees potential, James. He, he, he looks into our lives and into our hearts. And yes, He sees our weaknesses. He sees our failures. He sees our sins. But God sees the potential mm -hmm. of our lives. And so He labors with us. He works with us in infinite wisdom. He knows exactly what to allow and what to uh, forbid from taking place in our lives that will, that will move and navigate us through our experience in life to the, the best yielding of fruit in our Christian experience. So we need to keep positive, mm -hmm. we need to keep focus, and we need to keep perspective. We need mm -hmm. to understand why these things are happening to us. We need to know, as Manasseh probably learned and Nebuchadnezzar learned, that, that even though we go through some of these trials, I'm sure we've, you've been through them and I've been through them, that God is working to bring good out of them. God, I can look back on my life and I can say some of the greatest trials I faced were turning points in my Christian experience, mm -hmm. were, were areas where I needed to grow and where God was pruning in order mm. that more fruit would come forth. Oftentimes people, when they experience trials and suffering, they, they make the assumption that God is manufacturing mm -hmm. these trials for them. But in fact, the sin problem has imposed great suffering mm -hmm. and trial upon the human mm -hmm. race. And God is not the manufacturer of mm -hmm. evil things. I mean, we need to be very careful here because there are people who have experienced very difficult things mm -hmm. in this life. There are people who have been abused by their parents. There are people who have experienced tragedy. There are people who have gone through things that are just unthinkable. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't want to give the impression, and Scripture does not want to give the impression, that God is the author and source of terrible deeds that are committed against us. Right. But what we do know for certainty is that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose meaning that God, while He does not manufacture horrible things in our lives, God does guide us through those things mm -hmm. in order to bring good out of them. Absolutely. And, and there may be many of our listeners or viewers who are going through some trials or tra tra tragedies right now. Mm. Uh, I know that uh, each one of us, none of us are immune to that. And if you are, please remember this, that God is working to bring good out of it, that God is going to overrule that evil, that tragedy, that, that trial, He's going to overrule that for good and He's going to bring something good out of it that can be a turning point in your experience. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Hello, friends, and welcome back to our continuing study in Hebrews chapter 12. We're picking up here in verse 15. What Paul does here, Ty, is he's repeating one of the same points he brought out in the very beginning of the book, looking to Jesus. But in verse 15, after describing that trials and tests will come to us and that God doesn't bring them necessarily and overrules them for good because He loves us, he says we need to look diligently, lest mm -hmm. any man fail of the grace of God and lest 
lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble us and many be defiled. In other words, it is easy for us to lose sight of the fact that a loving God is not the author of evil, that He did not intend for mm -hmm. us to experience pain and suffering and misery and death. And to think that God is omnipotent and think that He is the one that is in charge of all of this chaos and evil and darkness in this world, we need to recognize that God is not the one that brings pain and suffering. Jesus said it this way, that I am come that you might have life and life more abundantly. The devil came to kill, steal, and destroy, but God has come to give us life. We're going to be inclined in our, in our human trials and temptations and the things that we go through, James, to hold other people accountable for the bad things that happen to mm -hmm. us. We're going to be inclined to be angry. Mm -hmm. We're going to be inclined to be resentful. And so Paul tells us, he says, listen, I want you, verse 14, to pursue peace with all people. Mm -hmm. I want you to be at peace with all people. And then again in verse 15, he says, I don't want you to allow a root of bitterness yes. to spring up in your life. We are inclined yes. to hold other people accountable for the things that happen to us. And Paul is saying, in a sense, let everybody off the hook. God has related to you in such a way as to extend mercy and mm -hmm. compassion and forgiveness. And we need to live by the same rule of forgiveness. We need to treat other people, even when they fail us, mm -hmm. the way that God has treated us through Jesus Christ by extending mercy and pardon. That's why I like Romans 8, 28, because it says, we know that all things work together for good mm. to them that love God, to the call, to those who are called, to them that love God. And, and, and I really like that because it says, not that we will be immune from evil or the effects of sin, but right. that we will, that God will work that for good, that He'll bring good out of that in our lives. And the way that we can be sure not to allow this root of bitterness, anger, and resentment to well up in our lives and, and then defile and pollute our relationships and mm -hmm. our relationship with God is to look diligently, to look carefully yes. to Jesus. As yes. we focus our attention on the Savior, mm -hmm. we will be far less inclined to find fault in others mm -hmm. and to allow bitterness to arise in our lives against them. Amen. So where are we going to from here? I think it's verse 18. Mm -hmm. Verse 18 is uh, making a shift here. There's a, okay. there, there's a new emphasis in this chapter now because Paul is telling us that we have a specific invitation and admonition to come somewhere, and it's not somewhere else that he specifies. Mm -hmm. Verse 18, he says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that burned with fire, to blackness and darkness and a tempest. You have not come, in other words, to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is what's being talked about here, where the people heard the trumpet, they saw the mountain shake, they were surrounded with darkness, there was lightning, the people trembled, the Apostle Paul informs us that they became afraid, and they begged Moses not to allow any more words from God to be spoken to them. And in that fear and in that trembling, they were inclined to turn from God. Mm -hmm. But now Paul is saying, no, that's not the experience God is calling us to. Amen. He's not calling us to an experience uh, of trembling and, mm -hmm. and pulling back from God, but he's actually calling us to draw close to the Lord mm -hmm. in verse 22. Yes. But you have come to Mount Zion, yes. to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the first born who are registered in heaven to God the judge of all to the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus, Jesus the mediator of the better covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. This is Abel. so powerful because what basically what Paul is saying here in the context of everything we've been reading is this you know God's people in Old Testament times were scared to death to approach to approach God to approach his presence to be in his presence but now now that we've seen Jesus, the forerunner, who's gone before, now that we've understood the essence of salvation, the gospel, the covenant, the better things, we can come. You know, Jesus has gone before. There's a general assembly and a church there. There are those whose names are written there. There are There is a mediator there. There is a heavenly host there. There's no reason for us to be afraid to go there. God is approachable. Amen. We can approach.
approach Amen. him. We can be in his presence and we don't need to fear. So he says in verse 25, see that you do not refuse him who speaks, which is again, one of the themes that in yes. different ways, Paul brings up over and over again in the book of Hebrews, mm -hmm. don't refuse, don't yes. draw back. Yes. It's just a continual encouragement, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. prodding, come on, we're moving on, we're coming yes. closer and closer to it's God. It's relational language. Yes, draw near to him, mm -hmm. he's friendly, mm -hmm. he's full of grace, mercy to forgive, grace to help in time of need, right. have confidence, move forward. Right, don't turn away. He goes on, it says, don't refuse him, don't turn away from him that speaks from heaven. In mm -hmm. other words, don't reject him. He's, he is seeking to court us. He's seeking to draw us to Him. Don't refuse these overtures because we recognize that if we are left to ourselves, if we are left to face the record of our lives, if we are left to bear our guilt and our sin, we are going to be overwhelmed. Mm. God wants to take care of that so that we can have that complete record taken care of and we can stand boldly before His throne. Another great thing that, that's brought to our attention here is that we have a destiny <clears throat> mm -hmm. that is brought to view here that involves fellowship, James, if we can imagine this. It involves fellowship with the angels mm -hmm. and innumerable company of angels. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, the book of Hebrews has informed us that occasionally we entertain angels unawares. Okay. I mean, we have encounters with angels because mm -hmm. they're sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation, Paul says. Mm -hmm. But we're not in an experience right now where we actually have face-to-face -face personal fellowship with angels. But this is something really to look forward to. Can you imagine that in eternity future, that we're going to actually enter into friendships and, and conversations with angelic beings who will be a part of our experience in the future? It's, it's just amazing. amazing. And, and also we're going to meet those angels that were probably working in our lives, uh, mm -hmm. helping us, guiding us, protecting us when we didn't even know about it. And they're going to share with us the experiences that they had with us mm -hmm. and how difficult it may have been at times for them to, to, to do the task that God had assigned to them in watching over us or in directing us in, in the way that He wanted us to go. Mm -hmm. Jesus actually indicates, I just wanted to, to bring this up, it just, just came to mind. Jesus indicated in Matthew chapter 18, James, that when uh, a child is born into the world, mm -hmm. that uh, a child is actually assigned yes. a guardian angel because he warned people who, who hurt children. He said, don't hurt little children. Mm -hmm. It would be better for you to have a, a large rock tied around your neck and be thrown into the depths of the sea because their angels, mm -hmm. these children's mm -hmm. angels, angels do always behold the face of their Father in heaven. So, so we see here that children are attended mm -hmm. by angelic companions who are there to watch over them, to protect them. We grow up and no doubt these angels follow us through our lives. I can't, I can't wait to finally meet my own guardian angel who knows everything about me, he's been mm -hmm. with me through life, to meet my own guardian angel face to face, to learn his name. I mean, they mm -hmm. have names. The Bible says that, that uh, there's an angel whose name is Gabriel. We have no reason to suppose that each of the angelic hosts don't have names. They each want to have a personal history. Mm -hmm. Each of these angels encountered the fall of Lucifer, mm -hmm. and these holy angels uh, endured through that great rebellion and mm -hmm. remained faithful to God and they'll have a testimony to share with us and, mm -hmm. and we'll have things to share with them and it's just going to be incredible fellowship. So we wherefore, Paul says in verse 28, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. There's the immutable, immovable presence of God. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably because there's no way we can serve God acceptably if we don't have grace with reverence and godly fear. Why? For our God is is a consuming fire. Now, what does that mean? Our God is a consuming fire. Well, first of all, it, it's interesting that that we have an invitation here, mm -hmm. but it's an ominous invitation because, because Paul is saying from verse 18 onward, mm -hmm. he's saying, come to the Lord, yes. come to Mount Zion. Yes. Our God is a consuming, consuming fire. fire. I mean, that doesn't seem inviting at first glance. Right. Why would I want to come into the presence of a God who is described as a consuming mm -hmm. fire? Mm -hmm. But throughout Scripture, we encounter this idea of fire. And it's interesting because, for example, in Daniel chapter 7, verses uh, 9 and 10, we're told that God is surrounded by fire mm -hmm. and a river of fire, a stream mm -hmm. of fire issues forth 
forth from before him. Yes. And then it says that in his presence, in the, the presence of that fire, yes. he is surrounded with 10,000 times 10,000 angels. Yes. Somehow these angels are in God's presence, mm -hmm. surrounded with this fire, mm -hmm. and they're not consumed mm -hmm. in the fire. They're praising God. They're ministering, God, ministering in God's presence and not being destroyed mm -hmm. by this consuming fire. So what is going to be destroyed by the consuming fire? You know, all through the Bible, especially in the New Testament, we find that rebellion, that sin, that that which is out of harmony with heaven, out of harmony with love, is the element that's going to be mm -hmm. destroyed in the consuming fire. In other words, those who stand in the consuming fire have separated from sin or have allowed Christ to separate sin from their lives. Mm -hmm. And we can stand in that consuming fire without that fire consuming us when we allow Christ to be our righteousness and when we accept mm -hmm. His gift of salvation and allow sin to be separated from our hearts. There are a number of verses in the Bible that, that fill out and kind of develop what's involved in this fire. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them I think of is in uh, the Song of Solomon chapter 8, yes. in, in which the, the, the um, Shulamite woman who's speaking back to Solomon, her beloved, mm -hmm. she says, set me as a seal upon your heart, as mm -hmm. a seal upon your arm, mm -hmm. for love is as strong as death mm -hmm. and jealousy is as cruel as the grave. And then it says something very interesting, James. It says the flames of love cannot be quenched. Mm -hmm. And it is like the very flame of Yahweh Himself. God's love is associated with fire. Mm -hmm. Also in Scripture, God's glory is associated, associated with fire. With fire. Mm -hmm. And in the Old Testament, it talks about how that those who stand in the consuming fire, those who have allowed God to cleanse them from that sin. You know, God is going to cleanse the earth. I mean, the Bible is very clear. Second Peter tells us that. Revelation tells us that. God is going to cleanse the earth. He himself is going to be the one that consumes sin and every vestige of sin from this earth. His presence of love consumes sin. But those can stand in the consuming fire of his presence are those who have allowed themselves to be divested of that sin through the grace of Christ. They've become partakers of the glory of God, of the character of God. So instead of this infinite contrast mm -hmm. of guilt and pain and self-incrimination, they come into the presence of God and find themselves perfectly at home for eternity in the consuming fire of God's love. And that's why Paul says in 13 verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Friends, we want you to let brotherly love continue to work in you, to consume sin in you now so that you can stand in God's presence then.